Next, we can talk about experimental research. So finally, what happens if we are able to manipulate at least one variable? You can, of course, manipulate more than one, but as we've seen already, when we're talking about these different types of research, we're kind of considering the most simplistic version. But once again, how does this new type of research compare to the others? Well, in our descriptive research, we were simply measuring and describing one variable. Then correlational research, we looked at the relationships, but they were only measured variables. So we had no directionality, no causality. So now with experimental research, finally, we manipulate the variables that we want to under some controlled conditions so that we're sure that the changes that we see in our measured variable have been caused by our manipulations. So now we're gonna have some extra considerations, things like, are we sure we've controlled for extra stuff in the background? Um, and that's one of the questions you always have to wonder when you are conducting research, but also reading research, because we've already seen the potential effects of those third variables, and those can still be problematic in experimental research, because if you haven't accounted for them or haven't controlled them in some way, um, they can still influence our results. So they haven't just gone away because of manipulations. But we're focusing here specifically on detecting these cause and effect relationships. Can we establish causality? Um, and we're going to be testing those theories that we've put in place. Is our framework, is our understanding of how this system works correct? Let's generate some hypotheses and test those to see if we support the theories that we have. Um, but we have some important variables, for, for some important, I guess, definitions to discuss. Um, and again, this might be complete review for you guys, but uh, our independent variable, or IV, is the variable that's being manipulated by the researchers. So a great example of this, we can talk about a drug trial, because it'll be a useful example for later too. But if we have a drug trial, and we want some people to receive the drug, and some people to not receive the drug, then receiving the drug yes or no is our independent variable. We could also have people who receive different doses of the drug, so uh, none, low, medium, and high doses. That would still be our independent variable because the researcher determines who receives what dose. So we've manipulated that variable, we've manipulated the dosage, so we know that's our IV. Our dependent variable, or dv, is the variable that's affected by the manipulation. So our measurement of the dependent variable will change depending on our manipulations. So if um, we were looking at an antidepressant, we would look at a measure of, say, mood, and we would hope that some of those people who received a certain dosage of that medication should show an increase in their mood. So their mood changes depending on the dosage they received. So our manipulation to the independent variable causes a change in the measure that we get of our dependent variable. So we're asking, how does our independent variable change or affect our dependent variable. We can also have some of those confounding variables. Again, another term being uh, extraneous variables or third variables. And again, some people would care to discriminate between those terms, um, sort of nitpicky ways. But basically, we can have extra variables that um, can affect our measures, that can affect our dependent variable that aren't necessarily controlled. So if we're looking at mood, what if uh, some people are being measured in the summer and some people are being measured in the winter? Um, mood tends to be affected by levels of sunlight. So the people being measured in the winter might have lower mood levels, not because of whatever dose they're receiving, but because of the time of year. So that would be a confounding variable. And we would have to make sure that we run all of our participants at the same time of year, or that we would run half of them in the summer and half in the winter, but 
each of our dosages would be equally split before, between those two times of year. That allows us to control for that confounding variable. Next terms, population versus sample. Now, population is a term you might have heard in relationship to biology courses, where they'll typically talk about a uh, group of interbreeding individuals that all live in a similar geographic area. For psychology, we use per, uh, population in a different way. So here, we're still looking at a set of individuals, but this is specifically the set of individuals that we want to draw a conclusion about. So if we are studying mood, our population would be whichever group of humans we want to be able to improve mood in. If we're really optimistic, we'd say all humans, or maybe we'd specify to uh, human adults or adult humans, whichever. Um, so we'd say, okay, we want to apply our sort of study on this drug to all adults in the world. So that would be our population. And obviously, that is a really ambitious uh, goal. And of course, we can't test on the entire adult population of Earth. So we have to take a smaller subset of those individuals to study. And we would call that subset our sample. And so we draw our sample from that population as a whole. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that we can decide who ends up included in our sample. We're going to have two main categories, simply being random sampling, like the two at the top, or non-random sampling, like the one at the bottom. However, um, you can break it down into different techniques. But if we start with the top, a simple random sample is a type of random sampling method where everyone in our population has an equal chance of being selected for our sample. So in this situation, we'd say, okay, so if we have the ID numbers of every human on Earth, which not viable, but let's go theoretically. And so we have access to that database and we'd use a random number generator to select a subset of those individuals. And as long as we're using something random, then everyone has an equal chance of being selected. Clearly, a simple random sample is pretty much impossible to do. There's almost always going to be some kind of limitation. Um, so this is like our ideal, this is what we aim for, but it isn't always attainable. Um, another option would be a stratified random sample. And so this is really useful if you have, say, a collection of individuals where out of your population, there is a very small number of individuals of one particular subgroup type. Um, so if we were looking at, I guess we can use people from different countries. So if we want representation for different countries that matches the representation in the population, if we have a place that has a very low population, there aren't that many people from that location, if we just use simple random sampling, because of chance, we might not select anyone from that very small group. Um, so we just might miss them because there were so few of them to begin with. So what we could do instead is say that, okay, 50% um, of our population at this Canadian university is from Canada, so we're going to take 50% of our sample from that subset. And then 10% of people at the university are from the US, so we're going to take 10% of our sample from that subset, and so on and so forth, where you're still randomly sampling, um, but we're specifically picking the different proportions, we are stratifying it in order to ensure that our sample is representative, which um, I guess we can hop to the next slide for the proper definition of that, but a representative sample is just saying that our sample reflects some important characteristic of a population. So with my example of we want to know which country someone is from, um, we would want the country distribution in our population to match the country distribution in our sample. And if we have a representative sample, our example here being our population, all of our different uh, letters and colors represent a different country, our representative sample matches that distribution. The pie charts look the same.
If we end up with an unrepresentative sample, some groups can end up being overrepresented and some groups can be underrepresented. Um, and in that situation, any conclusions that we draw based on this unrepresentative sample, it's harder for us to be sure that those findings apply back to the population as a whole. So ideally, we want as close to a representative sample as possible. Once again, there are always going to be limitations, but this is our goal. And you might have figured out, but using some of our random sampling methods, this is a way to try and make sure that everyone in the population has an equal probability of being chosen, and that should help us to make sure we have a representative sample. For non-random samples, there are tons of ways that you can do non-random sampling. So this usually happens because of study constraints, where ideally we would love to look at the entire adult population of the world, but as psychology researchers, we only have access to, say, the undergraduate research pool at our university. So now we don't have all adults, we only have the people at the university. So we're limited to people who have a background that has allowed them to get into post-secondary education. They are probably mostly around a particular age, since it is a first-year level course, um, and things like that. So we've already introduced some bias where any findings that we draw based on this non-random sample um, and this unrepresentative sample means that it's hard to make sure that those conclusions in our experiment apply back to the larger population. And our example of a subject pool would actually be called a convenience sample. That's because we're working with what we have. There are tons of other ways to non-randomly sample, some of the famous ones being things like uh, snowball sampling. It's really common for medical research when you have a very rare group um, with a particular disease. And so what you might do is find a couple of individuals with that disease or disorder and ask them to put you in contact with other people they know with that disease or disorder. Um, and that would get you access to more participants, but because you've had to go out and actively target people, your sample itself is biased. So yeah, we want a representative sample as much as possible. Uh, we would like to avoid unrepresentative samples, but it is not always possible to do so. And if we're talking about this logicking and reasoning about those non-random samples, what are some things that we would consider? So I have a couple of cases where it can be okay to have a non-random sample, to have a biased sample. Um, so our three main situations that I've come up with, um, maybe the similarity of a sample and a population doesn't matter. So if we're just looking to say that something can occur, then a simple example of it occurring in anyone within that population is sufficient to make that claim. So you don't really need a representative group of individuals from that population. You really just need the one case to show that it's possible. Uh, our second is that um, this is getting back to that idea of replication, where if we've had multiple experiments conducted on different samples pulled from different populations, if they all have similar results, that gives us more confidence that our research could apply, could be um, sort of generalized to a larger group than what we had originally thought. So if I've only been able to conduct my research at universities in Edmonton, but we also have someone who did research uh, on universities in Ontario, and someone who did some research with, say, instead of universities, um, what about a senior's home somewhere in the U.S.? Well, now, instead of only being able to talk about uh, Edmontonian university students, now we could probably make a conclusion about adults in North America. So by having multiple experiments that have all replicated or found the same results in different scenarios in different populations, um, that gives us a little bit more confidence in generalizing those findings. Um, and sometimes, for our last option, sometimes the similarity of our sample and our population is reasonable. And what this just means is that we don't necessarily need a representative sample to understand what it is that we're looking at. 
So maybe we're doing a bunch of brain imaging just to see what are the general shapes of all of the different structures. And if we don't really care, as long as a brain is a brain is a brain, um, we could just look at university students or we could just look at the people in this one city because there aren't massive differences in where structures are located, at least not to the degree that we care about. Sometimes you can make an argument for not having a random sample, um, or sometimes you can acknowledge that your sample is non-random, and it just means that we have to be careful with how we apply that knowledge, um, because that's the best you can do. So now that we have our sample, now that we've picked who we're going to be conducting our research on, what's the next step? Um, so next we can talk about our experimental group versus our control group. And I've already kind of hinted at this already, talking about our drug trial example, saying that we could have one group that receives a certain dose of the drug and one group that does not receive the drug. So in this situation, the group that receives the drug would be our experimental group. So some subjects or participants who are receiving some treatment um, based on our independent variable. So the researcher determines who receives what amount or what value of that IV. Our control group are going to be a similar group of subjects who do not receive that special treatment. Um, so this can be our comparison group. We want to compare our scores in the end between the group that received some treatment and the group that did not receive that treatment. And so if we are sure that these two groups start off fairly similar to one another, so we're saying they're alike in all respects. Um, and we would use a technique called random assignment here. Um, so I think, actually, let me double check. I don't, there's probably a slide for it later. Um, but we've been talking so far about random selection for selecting our sample. Random assignment is the next step where we assign the participants that we have into our two different groups. So you flip a coin and heads, this person is in the experimental group and tails, they are in the control group. Um, so we have that randomness introduced to split apart any potential variation. And so because of our random component, our experimental group and our control group should be pretty much similar to one another, or at least they shouldn't vary in a predictable way. Um, we can then manipulate our independent variable for one of our groups. The other group does not receive that treatment. And then the difference between the two groups, if they started out similarly, should be due only to that manipulation. So if our groups start with the same mood score and one group receives the drug and the other doesn't, then if our experimental group that received the drug is happier at the end of the experiment, then we would say that that increase in mood would be due to um, the treatment that they were given. We should also note that there can be an influence of expectations. Shouldn't be surprising, people are very easily influenced, but the placebo effect um, basically says that people might assume that they should be getting better um, simply because they've received a pill. And so that's why you might have heard of the term of a placebo, which is a treatment that has no therapeutic effect, but it's going to emulate some other aspect of the treatment. So if our experimental group received a drug and it was in pill form, then the uh, placebo group, our control, placebo control, I guess, um, should receive, say, a sugar pill. So they don't know that they are not being treated because the expectation of treatment actually leads people to assume that they should feel better and therefore they do feel better. So by giving them that sugar pill, we are making sure that it isn't just their expectations, but it's actually the effects of the drug. When we started talking about experiments, I mentioned that we would be looking at the simplest version first, one manipulated variable, one measured variable. But of course, there are always ways that we can modify this. And these are a couple of those. So first we could look at more than one dependent variable, more than one measured variable. 
So this would help us obtain a more complete picture of whatever the, the effect is that our independent variable has on our system of interest. So one of the examples that I can give is from my own research with our black cap chickadees as per usual, where we could have sort of one group instead of having an experimental group and a control group, we actually had two different treatment groups. So one uh, male calls were good and one female calls were good. So our two groups would be exposed to um, our learning process. And then we could measure one thing, one dependent variable. We looked at their rate of learning. So how quickly did they learn to respond to male calls for this group? Or how quickly did this group respond to female calls? That's just one measure though. We also wanted to measure their accuracy. So did one of these groups end up learning this relationship better than the others? Is it easier to learn male calls or female calls? We can look at their accuracy at the end. So here we get two different measures and we can ask questions about how quickly they learned depending on what type of treatment they received, but also what was their accuracy? How well did they perform um, based on the treatment that they received? Our second point is to expose a single group to two or more different conditions. Basically, you would have a single group of individuals who would receive multiple types of treatments. And this is really neat because it helps us reduce the potential for those extraneous or confounding variables. So again, we can hop ahead to the slide for that. And this is where we look at the difference between what we can call between groups uh, or between subject designs and repeated measures or within subjects designs. Now to take a step back for terminology, the experiments that we've been talking about so far have mainly all fallen under this idea of a between groups or between subjects experiment. And what that means is that we are comparing differences between different groups. So for those between groups, we have group one, our experimental group, and they receive treatment one. Exposure to, if we go with our drug example, they receive that drug. We then have a second group that gets whatever our second um, manipulation is for that independent variable. With our drug group, we were saying that they got no drug. And then what we do at the end is we compare the scores from those who received the drug to the scores from those who did not receive the drug, and we compare the means between those two groups, hence between groups. Um, we also say between subjects because we're saying that this group has these subjects and that group has those subjects. They are two separate groups of people. Now from that, you might have figured out where we're going with our repeated measures or within subjects design. But here, instead of having two or more separate groups, now we're saying that people in a group would be given multiple different types of exposures. So each participant gets exposed to all the conditions of our independent variable. So again, back here, we have this group of individuals and they would receive the treatment with the drug. And then after some time, they would also receive a period of time without the drug. But yeah, the point here being repeated measures, meaning we are having different exposures. We'd measure what their score is after that exposure. Then we'd give them our new exposure. And then we'd give them a measurement after that as well. So we're measuring the same people multiple times just to see what the effect is of each of the treatments that they receive. So it's within subjects because it's all the same people being measured over and over again. And the logic here, when we're talking about how this can reduce the potential for those extraneous variables, this also tells us that when we have two groups of two different um, um, people, then we're saying that these people have certain individual or independent differences. So maybe some of them are uh, a certain personality type, and some of them have a certain IQ score, and whatever else we care about. This other group doesn't necessarily match them perfectly. Through our random assignment, we're taking all of those potential differences, and we're splitting them up. 
so that we don't end up with sort of predictable variation, so we don't end up with, say, all the high IQ people in one group and all the lower IQ people in another group. We're just saying that there's going to be some variation and we've split it apart. But if we only have one group to begin with, then we don't have to worry about that because the people who are receiving treatment one are the same people who are receiving treatment two. So all of those individual differences, all of that variation because of the people themselves doesn't change between exposures. We're basically using these people as their own controls. So this is why those repeated measures designs can lead us to have uh, sort of a reduction in those extra variables. And if it's done right, it can actually lead us to having stronger, more powerful uh, results from our statistics. We get to be more confident in what we're seeing because we've reduced some of the noise in our data. Um, okay, so that was the first two points. The third point here is that we can manipulate more than one independent variable. And this is really neat because it lets us study interactions. So we know from experience that a lot of things are a lot more complicated than just one particular variable or one particular trait controlling something else on its own. Usually there are multiple factors involved. So if you design an experiment that manipulates multiple factors, you can actually get something maybe closer to what we'd see in the real world. Those interactions can be very useful to understand how things work in the real life. So let's look at an example for that one. And so here we have uh, a study that's set up with two independent variables. They wanted to look at cell phone use. So they have people who are driving without a cell phone and people who are driving while using their cell phone. Our second independent variable would be the amount of traffic that's on the road during this test. So low traffic density versus traffic density. So now we have four groups. So we have people who drive without their cell phone in low traffic density, people who are driving without their cell phone in high traffic density, and then people driving with their cell phone in low density and with their cell phone in high density. So now we have four groups so that we have each of the possible combinations of our two independent variables. So we'd say that each independent variable has two levels within it. And with our results over here, we're looking at the breaking reaction time, basically saying how long do people take to react to something coming up on the road in front of them. Um, so a higher score is worse. And then we have low traffic density for these two bars and high traffic density for these two. And the green ones are driving with no cell phone and the purple ones are driving with a cell phone. We would look at this and say, okay, these two bars are fairly close together. If they had error bars, the error bars would likely overlap, and we'd get a label that says there is no significant difference between these two bars. We would also probably have an indicator that says that this bar is no different from either of these two either. So all three of these bars are not significantly different from each other. They're all very, very close together. However, this last bar here for people who are driving and using their cell phones in high density traffic, they are going to show a significant increase in the amount of time it takes them to break in response to something in the road. So using their cell phone is very detrimental, but only in high traffic density conditions. Because this only shows up in high density, it's not showing up in low density, that tells us that there is an interaction between traffic density and uh, cell phone use. And with that out of the way, we can get started talking about uh, types of statistics once again. We had mentioned before that we look at descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Um, but since we've already done the descriptive side, we're going to focus into those inferential statistics. And the reason is, is that now we've established sort of how we set up our multiple groups. And now we would look at uh, the question of, is there a difference between these two groups? Is there a difference in the mood score between the group that received our antidepressant drug and the group that did not receive the drug?
and our inferential statistics allow us to interpret the results that we got and draw conclusions about whether there is a significant difference between the groups or not. So here are some very basics of how that works. And as per usual, if you've taken a stats class, this is very, very simplified. I'm not getting you to calculate anything. I'm mainly looking to get you to understand the logic of what we're talking about when we say there is a significant difference between our groups. So how are we making that determination? A lot of it is going to be probabilistic. So the first things we need to understand uh, is going to be the concept of hypothesis testing and our types of hypotheses that we would be testing. So this ties back to our idea of uh, generating predictions. So once we have our experimental design, we have two possible predictions. Um, so hypothesis testing revolves around the fact that we have two competing hypotheses. So one of the hypotheses is going to be that the relationship that we're predicting to see is actually happening. The alternate or the other hypothesis is going to be that the relationship we expected to see is not happening. So they have names that are conventionally assigned. So our null hypothesis is what the name says. It is a hypothesis that's saying that nothing is going on. There is no relationship. So we're saying there is no relationship between our variables of interest in our population. So uh, the drug is not uh, going to be affecting mood in our drug exposure experiment. And we could break that down further and say, okay, um, there is no significant difference between the mood scores of our treatment group and between the mood scores of our control group. So there is no relationship there. Nothing has happened. Um, and if we want to specify that in a slightly different way, we would be saying that our observations, any differences that we found between those two groups, uh, it is very likely that they've occurred due to random chance or random error that came from our sampling process. Basically, we've acknowledged that no matter what, there's going to be some flaws here. There's always going to be a little bit of fluctuation, some variation in our data. If there is a lot of variation, then it's highly likely that we could find what look like differences in our groups on the surface that aren't actually real differences. So a quick example of that would be to look between these two bars here, where yes, the purple bar is a little bit higher than that green bar, but I told you that there is no difference between these two measures. And the reason for that being that there is likely some spread to the data. And so in that situation, we're saying that these two are effectively the same. There is no significant difference between the two meaning that we would have accepted our null hypothesis when we looked at the differences between these two particular groups. So that's the null hypothesis. Our alternative is that there is actually a relationship between the variables of interest within our population. So this is saying that it would be very unlikely for uh, the observations that we got, the means of our two groups, um, to occur due to chance. Um, this is very unlikely to have happened unless there really is a relationship. And so from that conclusion, we'd say, well, if we got very, very rare results, if we made the assumption that there's no relationship, then we must assume that there is a relationship and that our results are a result of that relationship. So if things are too different to be explained by chance, like the null hypothesis would have us say, we reject our null hypothesis and we accept the alternative. So what, what do we use to make that determination? And like I said, a lot of this is made based on probability. So this is a very probabilistic judgment. And so we would say that we assume there is going to be a normal distribution of the potential for error. And this is saying that even if our two groups had the exact same means, 
um, there's sort of some room that maybe because we sampled a little bit differently or one group has a little bit more individual variation than the other, um, if this is our difference between the two means, we could have people having a differences in those scores um, and the further away the means get, the less likely it is for them to have measured as different if they aren't different in reality. So we're looking at measurement error. And the further the difference between our two points, so again, hopping back to this diagram because it's easier to see. So saying that these two are, the difference is very small. So it's likely that those numbers are in reality close enough together that we would call them the same. But if we look at these two here, that much, much larger difference between our two means, that larger score tells us that we're getting further and further away from the center point of our normal distribution. So for the first two bars, maybe it's only this difference. But for the second two bars, maybe we're looking at the difference from the middle all the way to say here, because it was a big difference between means. And we use um, statistical calculations in the background. And again, we hand wave those because we do not need to calculate them for this class. But if our differences are this large, we would be saying that out of all of the possibilities that we would predict, if there was no real relationship, something this extreme is very unlikely to have occurred. So if this tells us what we would predict if our null hypothesis were true, but we're seeing something way, way off to the sides, way in the extremes, we're saying it's very unlikely that that happened in a situation where there's no relationship. So we make that judgment, and the standard is usually a 5% cutoff. So in this case, we'd say that there is less than a 5% chance that we would get a difference between our groups this extreme if there was no real relationship here to find. Um, alternatively, we'd be saying that we are sort of um, more than 95% sure that it's something other than chance that led us to get such an extreme difference between our two groups. And that 5% is just an arbitrary cutoff that's been set by scientists. Um, sometimes if people are very concerned about certain types of errors, which we'll mention in a few slides, um, they can actually go with instead of a 5% uh, chance, they can go with a 1% chance. So if you've seen a uh, the standard being P of 0.05, for that 5% odds. Um, you might also see a P of 0 0.01 or that 1%. And if you use a P of 0 0.01, we are saying that we need to be 99% or more certain that what we've observed is not due to chance. In that case, we have to be pretty darn confident that what we found is coming from some relationship that we're measuring in our population. And so for more words uh, in slightly different ways to help get that point across, we would talk about statistical significance. Um, we would say it exists when the probability of obtaining a result as extreme as what we got um, would be very low if the assumptions of our null hypothesis are true. So if we got this large of a difference between our groups, it is very unlikely to have occurred if there was actually no difference between those groups, if there was no real relationship present. So if we say that there is significance or if there is a significant difference, we reject the null hypothesis and we say that we are fairly confident that there is a relationship between our variables. We are going with our alternative hypothesis and we're saying that yes, there is a relationship here. Yes, there is a difference between these two groups. Now, I did mention error momentarily. Um, so we talked about that worry um, where sometimes people will get concerned about maybe accidentally concluding that there is a relationship when there isn't a relationship present. 
So if you think about it, our P of 0 0.05 as a cutoff says that we would accept there being a 5% chance that we got this extreme value, not because there's actually a relationship, but because there was a lot of variability, a lot of error in our data. So 5% of the time, you would end up with what we'd call a false positive, where we concluded that there is a causal relationship between our two variables, when in reality there wasn't. We just happened to get an extreme score due to chance. So this is sometimes also called a type one error. And there are a couple of different names for this, but I prefer using a type one error or a false positive because that's the most intuitive for me. Um, so in that case, a researcher might choose instead of using that 5% cutoff to go with the more strict 1% cutoff or saying that we need a P value that is smaller than 0 0.01. Um, in that case, we would be uh, sort of 99% or more sure that there really is a relationship here. Um, the one issue with that is that by being more strict, yes, we've reduced our possibilities of getting a false positive. However, we've actually increased a different type of error. And this is type two error. And this is when you miss something that's actually there. So if uh, actually, I can go back here. So if we have our curve here, and this is that cutoff for 5%, the yellow is 5% of all the possible scores. If we set 1% arbitrarily over here by that minus 3, if this is how strict we would be for that uh, P of 0 0.01 or smaller, um, if something fell here, it's still fairly likely that there's a relationship, but our new cutoff wouldn't count it. So if there really was a relationship and it was here, um, but we cut off here, we wouldn't count it as being a real relationship. So that's where we'd have a type two error, where we missed a relationship. So we concluded that there is not a relationship between our two variables, but there actually is. I have this here as other uh, considerations, but I'm actually gonna skip this slide because it comes up again in a couple of slides. I had intended to drag it to where this second version of the slide is, um, but somehow ended up copying it instead. So we're just gonna skip it here and then come back to it um, because I wanted to talk about our pros and cons of our experimental research first. So what are the pros? Obviously, we've been stressing that experimental research is fantastic for getting causality. We want to know the cause and effect relationship between these two variables. And because of our manipulations and because of our controls, we are able to make those conclusions. The cons actually relate to some of our issues with all of those controls. So some people would argue that controls in experiments mean that the experiments themselves are now very artificial. So the more that we hold constant or the more that we are um, sort of eliminating the potential for variation in other variables, the less like things in nature the experiment becomes. Because out in the real world, there are lots and lots of moving pieces that all interact. But if we're holding all of those constant, then we've kind of lost that complexity. So we have to consider, do, do the results that we collected in the lab actually apply to the real world anymore? Or does it only tell us something about how this works in a controlled environment? There are, of course, also, also ethical practices um, or ethical issues uh, and even practical issues. An ethical issue would be something like we can't assign somebody to do something that would harm them. So you can't assign someone to be raised in a low socioeconomic status household or a high socioeconomic status household. You can't assign someone to be a smoker or a non-smoker. There are certain things that you are just not able to do. So in those cases, you would have to rely on correlational studies where you can't make something happen, but if it has happened, you can collect data to look at the relationships that exist. We just won't be as certain of causality because of a different methodology.